If your wide area network connection is using a satellite, then it's communicating using non-terrestrial links. You are going directly from your facility up to a satellite and then back down to Earth. You're communicating through space to send those digital signals. If you're using a satellite connection for your wide area network, then it's probably going to be a little bit more expensive than what you would pay if you had a terrestrial network connection. It costs a lot of money to put these satellites into orbit, and you have to pay some of that cost to be able to transmit your signals up to that satellite and receive them on the downlink. But you can get some pretty good speeds out of these connections. These off-the-shelf satellite systems can provide you with 5 megabits down and 1 megabit up. And if you have a remote site or you're in a location that does doesn't allow you to connect into any type of terrestrial type of connection for your network. And this could be a really viable alternative, especially if you're on a cruise ship, you're in the middle of a distant location, or maybe you just aren't interested in connecting to anything on Earth. You want to be sure that you always have that connection up to the satellite, and you don't have to worry about any type of local connectivity for your wide area network. One significant disadvantage of communications into space is that it takes a bit of time to get the signal up to space, and it takes a little bit of time to get the signal back down again. So sending one packet from one side to the other means you have about a 250 millisecond latency all the way up. That's a quarter of a second, and another 250 millisecond latency on the way back down again. So for a single packet to go back and forth, half a second has gone by. And in the world of networking, that is a long time. So if you're using applications that are very sensitive to latency, they're real-time applications, they're things where someone's trying to interactively do something, this may not be the best type of connection for you. But if you're running a situation where you have a convenience store and you're sending credit card information to simply have that credit card information validated and sent back, a satellite connection can be low cost. It's not using a lot of bandwidth. And you don't care a lot about the latency. There's a very small transaction that takes place, and you're done. So it may depend on the application you're using as to where a satellite connection may make sense or not. Another challenge you have with satellite connectivity is you have to be able to see the satellite. And very often, you're using very high frequencies to communicate between the station on the ground and the connection that's on the satellite. And if you have any type of interference in between, it can affect the throughput or even the availability of that network connection. You have something that's commonly called rain fade. If you have a bad thunderstorm, it now becomes impossible to send a signal up because the rain and the clouds are affecting the ability for you to send that high frequency signal all the way through. The satellite can't see you. You can't communicate any of that. You also have to make sure you have a line of sight all the way up to the satellite. You can't bend this around corners. There can't be a tree in the way. You have to make sure that you're able to have an absolutely clear view between your dish and that satellite connection. One of the earliest multiple use digital type connections that we had was something called ISDN. That stands for Integrated Services Digital Network. It's not only a digital network, as the name implies, but you were able to put voice and data over a single standard phone line that might come into a building, might come into a home, or any other facility. One of the smaller versions of ISDN is called a BRI connection. It stands for Basic Rate Interface. And we sometimes refer to that as a 2B plus D connection. The B that's there, or the two of the Bs that are there, refer to bearer channels that are over this connection. There are two bearer channels on a BRI connection. Each of those channels is 64 kilobits per second in speed. And by having both of those channels work together, you could get as much as 128 kilobits per second of total throughput coming through that connection. There's also, on a BRI connection, a D channel. The D channel doesn't have the normal data going over it. It's a completely separate separate channel. It's only a 16 kilobit per second channel, but it's the channel that is used for signaling, for making sure that the connection is brought up and making sure the connection is torn down at the end. And there's a completely separate D channel that's used just for that purpose. In larger environments, you may need a lot more throughput. You may need many more connections coming in. So the larger type of ISDN connection is called a PRI connection. That stands for Primary Rate Interface. And usually, they're bringing in a T1 connection or an E1 connection. And they're running these ISDN signals over those T1 or E1 signals. And because of that, you can see on a T1 line, you have 23 B channels that can come in with a single D channel that's used for signaling. And on an E1, you have 30 B channels 
channels, a D channel, and there's an extra alarm channel associated with that. We commonly see these T1 or E1 sized ISDN channels coming in, these PRI lines, so that you don't have to bring in multiple single phone lines. Instead of bringing in 23 separate lines that come in from 23 separate settings on 23 separate wires, you can instead bring in a single PRI connection, and inside of that, are the 23 phone lines. And that makes it much simpler to be able to manage physically. And it's also much easier to manage from a PSDN or a phone line perspective. We don't really use ISDN to bring those digital signals into our home any longer. We use something called DSL. DSL stands for Digital Subscriber Line. And there are different types of DSL connections. One of the most common you'll run into is ADSL, or Asymmetric Digital Subscriber Line. We use just standard telephone lines that may already be in your home to provide these DSL connections. Back at the phone company, they'll change your line over from the traditional phone line and then move it into a DSL type line. The reason we call this type of DSL ADSL with the asymmetric is the speeds that you are downloading are very often different than the speeds that you are uploading. So that particular speed difference is asymmetric. There's also a limitation on how far you can send these digital signals because they're going over standard phone lines. These phone lines were never designed originally to have these high speed networks on them. And the farther away you get from a central office, the slower the speed is going to be. And ultimately, once you get about 10,000 thousand feet away from that central office, you'll have no signal left. You won't be able to use DSL at all. On the higher end DSLs, you can have as much as 24 megabits downstream and 3.5 megabits upstream. So this can be a relatively significant data source, especially if you're running a home office or you need that type of connectivity going directly to a house. A type of DSL that never caught on was the symmetric DSL, or SDSL. It was symmetric because you had the same speeds on the upstream as you did on the downstream. And although it makes perfect sense, because sometimes you need that level of bandwidth when you're sending traffic out, it's not a standard that really caught on. Instead, the standard that has really moved forward is the VDSL, or very high bitrate DSL. And you can get throughput speeds on VDSL anywhere from 4 megabits per second all the way up to 100 megabits per second. Well, if we're bringing in digital signals on our old telephone lines, then it makes perfect sense that we could also bring digital signals in over a cable connection. And since most of our homes also have cable television connections, the cable companies have realized that they can also provide you with internet access or data over those connections. So this is something called DOCSIS. That's the standard that is used to send this data. It's called Data Over Cable Service Interface Specification. So if you ever look at your cable modems, you may notice that they use a DOCSIS standard to be able to send that traffic. The different DOCSIS standards that are out there allow you to send data over these cable modems from 4 megabit all the way through 100 megabit per second. So you can get some very high speeds from these cable modem connections. You also are able to not only send your television through this connection, you could send your internet access or your data through this connection and your telephone lines as well using voice over IP. So bringing in that digital connection into the home or into your small business really provides you with a lot of flexibility over what services you might want to use. Although we're not bringing in new connections these days for modems, we often have a lot of legacy systems that may still be sitting around that use standard telephone lines and modems like this to be able to communicate from one side to the other. If you have any systems that might have faxes or fax modems connected to them to send and receive faxes, they may have a modem connection like this associated with them. Because they're running over standard analog phone lines, you have very limited frequencies that you're able to send over that, and therefore very limited bandwidth that you're able to communicate over. The best we can really get with our 56 kilobit per second modems at the best possible level is a compression type that might provide you with up to 320 kilobits per second, but that is a theoretical maximum. Generally, if you're already sending compressed data through these connections, you're really getting about 56 kilobits per second, so not very much throughput through there at all. And it's difficult to scale this up. You can put multiple modems in place, and there are even systems that might take all of that data 
and bind the data together to give you higher throughputs, but it becomes more and more difficult to have separate phone lines coming in for each one of those and be able to get higher speeds. Instead, people opt for a T1 line and a T3 line, a cable modem or a DSL type connection coming into their facility. So these days, you find them on the legacy system, something that's always going to run over a modem until the time comes that you're no longer using that system, you're no longer interested in keeping that legacy system alive, and then you might phase it out. But in the meantime, these modems provide you at least with a very simple connection, and it's going to run over the existing very simple to use telephone line.